Thank you. Last week, I had a wonderful experience with a group of teenagers. We were doing a ranking activity uh, during a class, and it was surprising that when we asked them to rank, activities, meaningful activities on Sabbath, worship was the last. Family, uh, visiting sick people, or personal activity, they came first. And I was asking is the Sabbath still oriented to God, to worship? Or is it centered now on family, friends, and relatives, or on self? Um, I'm so happy that uh, Pastor Ekoto has decided to bring us back to the commandment <laughs> and now we will have exploring the sabbath commandments right in exodus 28 to 11 and deuteronomy 5 12 to 15 a comparative study i don't know how to present a well-known person because i don't know how to present pastor ikoto uh, i do want to mention that he is a PhD student in education with a strong background in theology and pastoral care. And I understand why he chose this topic. Let's bow head for a word of prayer. And after that, Pastor Ekoto will talk to us. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you again because you are using these wonderful people to help us remember the Sabbath. As your servant is going to present this comparative study, please send your Holy Spirit and talk to each one of us. We ask you all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, Pass away, good. Okay, good morning. Good morning. I thank God for this opportunity uh, he has given to me to open the sacred pages. I deem it a privilege and I pray that we will learn something from this comparative study. One time I met a lady, um, first deacon's wife, and I could see she was very angry at the church, but she was going to church every Sabbath. And in the course of the conversation, one of the reasons of her anger came out. She just said that when she got converted to Adventism, she was taught in the crusade that Adventists follow the Bible and the Bible alone. But when she started joining the church, she realized that we are not following the Bible because we don't uh, take the Lord's Supper on Thursday night like Jesus did. And that you could sense it is a big issue for her. And for years you could feel that she was angry with that. Then I just opened the Bible to her and showed her in, in the book of Acts. And, and she was, you could see that light in her eyes. So that's what I'm going to try to do now. And that's why I study the word of God. For myself and for people to understand. Just turning those pages. We have unresolved issues. And this is one of them. 
Because when you look at the renditions of the Sabbath commandments in Exodus and Deuteronomy, you can be perplexed because they are different. And if you have the mindset that the Bible and the Bible alone, if you have the mindset that uh, we shouldn't add or subtract words, you can run into a problem with these two commandments, especially that it is in the Ten Commandments. And I found it uh, important for us to explore these differences. So the problem that I'm trying to address is that the rendition of the Sabbath commandment in Exodus 20 differs from the one in Deuteronomy 5. And my purpose is to evaluate the similarities and the differences and to derive the meaning and the theological import for us today. Many studies have been done on this issue, and I just wanted to have my own reading, get some gleanings, and try to find out if the Sabbath theory can be confirmed. So I used word study as methodology, literary analysis, structural analysis, and I will give you some findings later. But in, in, in this quest, I hope that those differences will not become a stumbling block, but rather an avenue to explore more. This, is, this may be just the beginning of a journey for someone here. The background of Exodus 28 to 11, where the Sabbath commandment is in the Ten Commandments, revealed me this. I never knew that between Exodus 1 to 12, or 12, sorry, and Exodus 19, there were only three months. And I was surprised to discover that each month there was something that was instituted for Israel. The first month was the Passover, the second month, the manna, and the third month, the covenant. And each of these represents God, and this is very important for my study. The, the Passover presents God as the deliverer. The manna presents God as the provider. And the covenant pre pre presents God as the legislator for his people. When you go to Deuteronomy 5, which is uh, about 40 years later, 4-0, the context is a little bit different. There, there is a transition in leadership going on, and a transition in what I call membership. If you remember the story well, Moses was passing the baton to Joshua, and at the same time, there was a new generation that didn't know Egypt that was coming into play. So the context of the Deuteronomy is quite different from the context of Exodus 20. This is the translation that I suggested and you could see highlighted in green the differences between the two renditions. I will point out at the ones in Deuteronomy 5 because that's where most of the problem lies. In Deuteronomy 5, it starts with the verb keep, not remember, as in Exodus. And there is a phrase that is added there, as the Lord your God commanded you. Now, you might stumble and meet a church member who will confront you with this and tell you the Bible is not accurate because you said that God has to speak the same way. It's literal. We shouldn't add or subtract. But here we see, and there are many explanations given to this. And in the third verse of the commandment, you see there is a repetition of Exodus 20 verse 10, but there is an addition of the word your male ass or donkey, and then the phrase that your male slave and your male servant may rest like you. And then the, the last verse is completely different. Completely different. These are ten commandments given by or through the same Moses. Why these differences? When you look at the structure that is derived from the the translation here, you will see that 
Exodus and Deuteronomy have the same structure, except that in Deuteronomy, there is an added comment, uh, two added comments. But all of them have an introductory enunciation and two explanatory statements, and then a conclusion. But the conclusions differ. One is for creation, and the other one is for redemption. Now, these are the findings, a few. There are many more, but I just selected for the interest of time. I looked at the construct Yom Shabbat, which means the Sabbath day. Literally, you can translate it the day that is the Sabbath or on the day that is the Sabbath. It looks as if the author wants to single out a specific day among others. It is not any ordinary day. It is the Sabbath day. For those who study languages, the article can make a big difference. If God said or Moses said, a Sabbath day, you would have different perspectives on this issue. So this is very basic, very important. Another thing is that the six days are attached to a verb, which means to work or to serve. And that, those six days, we are demanded or as expected to do all the work or all the occupation that we have. And that is the work of, for livelihood. Interestingly, most versions translate to keep or to observe for the Cal infinitive, which can also mean to do or to make. The Targum says to make or to do. And uh, there are other versions, and especially the Greek Bible, which says, which uses the word to keep. They agree on that. But what I find interesting is that the Targum says to do, to make. Maybe that's one way to say we, we make the Sabbath, we do the Sabbath. There is something that must be done about it. It's an action. It is not only about remembering. It must be done. There is an intentionality in the Sabbath. I'll bring this together later. There is another construction. Adonai Eloiha, the Lord, your God, which appears in verses 12, 14, and 15 of the Deuteronomy 5. Now, it is very interesting because it doesn't appear many times in the Pentateuch, especially with the Sabbath, but it's very prominent in the Sabbath, three times in the commandment. I see that the author is trying to point out at the centrality of God. I mean, this answers Pastor Senek's uh, quest. God is central to the Sabbath commandment. As its legislator, if you remember the background I gave earlier, its originator and the deliverer. There is a singular suffix, your God, I wanted to look at. And I looked at it. Your suggests a personal relationship between the transcendent God and the immanent God or the being and the Sabbath keeper. For me, I understand that in the Sabbath, you discover the God who creates, but also that God who creates becomes the God who relates to us. Another aspect that I found is that Le Kodesh, um, it said to make it holy. You see, you remember I pointed out the Targum which says to do, to make. We make it holy. God made it holy, but God says you remember the Sabbath to make it holy. You also have a part as a Sabbath keeper to make it holy. There are some other occurrences of make holy in the Pentateuch, from uh, Genesis to Deuteronomy. But they apply to God, to the priesthood, to the priestly garments, to the sanctuary services and its utensils, and to the Sabbath. These are the only thing in the Pentateuch that are supposed to be made holy. So the Pentateuch makes holy the divinity, God, 
the humanity through the priesthood, the space, the sanctuary, and the time. Now, when you glean through other Pentateuch, you find here and there, make God holy, make humankind holy, make the sanctuary holy, make the Sabbath or the time holy. It's here and there. And it, it equals the creation also, because when you look at Genesis 1 to 2, there is a partness or sanctity or holiness in God, in humanity, in Eden, the space, and in the Sabbath. But what interested me is that it is only in the Sabbath that I found all the four together. God, humanity, space, and time. And this, I called it compounded holiness. It looks as if the Sabbath is the epitome of holiness in the cycle of creation, in the cycle of the life of the universe, where everything becomes sanctified or holy on that day. Another thing that I looked at is what the linguists call hendiadis. It's a big word just to say that if you want to emphasize two things, instead of making one the adjective and the other one the noun, you put the conjunction end. So in this expression, God says, I have uh, set you free from Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched hand. The hand is mighty, one side, and outstretched. This may highlight God's hand not only as potent, but also as moving. It is moving potency. This should be the way we would say it today. But Hendiadis demands that we add and in between to emphasize the two. And we shouldn't overlook that God is not only powerful in, he doesn't have only power in his hand, but that power moves things, moves his people, moves us from one state to another. It's a moving potency. And then he concludes, therefore, because of my moving power, keep the Sabbath day. God's deliverance must lead to human observance or Sabbath Observance. So this, I'm driving somewhere with all these points. Another thing I found out was that both renditions of the Sabbath commandments address three things. The what, remember, keep, how, work, don't work, and the why, creation or redemption for Sabbath observance. The Sabbath keeper must combine these three aspects every Sabbath. Unfortunately, many of us in the church, I think we are factocentric in our Sabbath observance. We, we, we rely only on the what we remember. Some are mechanocentric. It's mechanics, Sabbath mechanics. How? Do this, don't do that. But there is a third approach, which is theocentric. The why. Why do you do that? When you look at the why, it's about creation, redemption, and even sanctification later in Ezekiel. In other words, if I had to give a grade to Christians or Sabbath keepers, I would say that see, see uh, Sabbath keepers with, with, with the grade C are in the what. B are in the mechanics. And the A are in the theocentric, if you want me to put it that way. And this is expected of us every Sabbath. Another interesting fe feature is the difference between the verb from the beginning, remember and keep. These are the different uh, explanations that scholars give. They say it's a shift of focus, a stronger version, a shift in theological emphasis, a clarification, an enriching explanation, an expansion, a development. But for me, it's not just another interpretation, and this is very important for me, or homiletical usage, because some say that Moses was preaching, and I agree, because when you look at the comment, he's commenting, just as the Lord your God, and he's speaking to the people. So it's like preaching to the people about the Ten Commandments, and the Sabbath in particular. But I see here the Sabbath as 
a revelation of some aspects and facets of God, the God of the Sabbath. We learned the other day that God is equated to Sabbath. The same pattern is seen is in the Abrahamic covenants. You see, in Genesis 12, the, the covenant is stated in a way. When you go to Genesis 15, it is stated in a different way. There is some addition, but it's the same covenant. You see the same in Joseph's dream. There is a kind of progression in the revelation. So, for me, the Sabbath connects us to creation, to God as the provider, as the redemptor, and, and the sanctifier. In other words, all these renditions of the Sabbath just show us aspects of God's character. I think we shouldn't miss that point. If we have to look at the Sabbath on a theocentric way, we should not look at the Sabbath as one day for 24 hours to do or not to do, but God is revealing himself in different ways in each of these texts. So for me, there is no contradiction. There is progression. There, we have different facets. It's about God revealing himself to us through his day. So the different renditions of the Sabbath commandment actually reveal facets of God and his work. And that's why I believe Christ was trying his best to reveal all these facets to the people on the Sabbath. There is another commentary. As the Lord your God has commanded you. Some people use this to say, oh, Moses added, therefore, it is not of God. Therefore, this is not the God's commandment. But I rather argue that because he added this sentence or this phrase, it is not a disclaimer of divine authority, but a disclaimer of mosaic authorship. Moses is saying, you see, what I'm talking to you about is not from me. It's from the Lord himself. There is an added commentary, your male ass or a male donkey. A donkey in the Old Testament represented a means of transportation for goods or for people, a working tool, a part of the livestock, and a sign of prosperity. You see, it's, it's like one will say a car today. My car, when we work with our car, that's the role of a donkey. And it's a sign of wealth also. In the, in the Old Testament. So when the, the, the Deuteronomy adds the donkey, I understand that though in Exodus there are some animals from the household, but he adds this. He inserts this. I, I think he wants to say that, well, when, when what you use to work, your donkey rests, you also rest in the family. If the donkey is working, I cannot be resting because I'm the owner of the donkey. So if I want to enjoy the Sabbath, the things that I use for work must also rest, not only the people. That's why sometimes when you see our helpers, they have to work on sometimes on Saturday whilst we are worshiping in church. It doesn't fit in this. Our car that we use for work, we should be used for other purposes, not for work. In Exodus 20, verse 8, sorry, I have to take some more. The commandment applies the verb zakar, remember, to the Sabbath day. But in Deuteronomy, it applies the verb zakar to remember the God's mighty deliverance. It applies the same verb to different issues. So beyond creation and redemption, I learned that God's intention for his people was holiness. So keeping the Sabbath is a means to an end. It's not the end in itself. And the end is holiness. So in conclusion, I understand by my, after my study that the differences are not minimal, but significant. They are not contradictory, but they expand our understanding in the context of progressive revelation. I also understand that the, the, the similarities and similarities between the two renditions affirm and confirm the seven-day Sabbath as divine in origin, universal in scope, and eternal in nature. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Pastor Ekoto. And everybody knows that when I'm coordinating, I always ask the first question. <laughs> uh, we have to entertain the, the question right now, but let me just ask uh, uh, one thing to our presenter. In the beginning, you say that uh, in Exodus, it, the focus is on creation, and in Deuteronomy, it's on redemption, because there is a shift. Uh, can we say that we are facing now another shift? in our secular world, what will be the commandment right now? Okay, thank you for the question. Actually, from what I learned, and a point I made is that there is a progression in the understanding, not of the Sabbath per se, but of the God of the Sabbath. And I had that feeling that if God were to speak to us today, my, maybe he would, uh, he would speak differently and add something so that we don't stick only to the day and the time, but on the person who feels that day and that time, who is the, the inventor of the day. I don't know the exact answer to that now. I, I'm thinking of studying more personally. But there is even a third, instead of inspired on, not only about creation and redemption, but I mentioned sanctification. And you can even add the aspect of glorification when you look at Isaiah 66. So the Sabbath covers even the plan that God has for, for humanity. That's what I, I, I want to see the Sabbath as God invading time and space with man. Thank you very much, so that it could be not keep or remember, but sanctify the Sabbath. Thank you very much. Uh, now, uh, let me uh, see if you have questions. One, okay, le we, 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 let's start with Pastor Colley. Okay, thank you. Um, this is the um, comparison between the two passages. Now, this is only a portion of the Ten Commandments, but in both uh, renditions, it starts with, I am the Lord your God who saved you. That's the, the big uh, context. But I focused only on the commandment to look at how they, 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 they are similar or dissimilar. And the emphasis here you, is clear that in Exodus 20, for in six days the Lord made. But in Deuteronomy he says, remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt and the Lord your God brought you out from there. So it seems that Moses wants to, to ingrain something that in the minds of the listeners and remember it's the new generation and there is even one thing I, I couldn't say because of time the, in Exodus there is liberation then the commandments but in Deuteronomy there is the commandments then conquest 
it's it seems it's it serves for different purpose but i think he just wants to give them a rational a rational for these law for specifically for this uh commandment in their in their context it's not a matter of being so different it may be a difference in emphasis for for moses at this time that's how i that's the best answer i could give just a difference of emphasis but not a huge uh, difference in anything uh, more than that that's what i understand thank you thank you pastor can we ask pastor tim Okay, there was a presentation here the other day uh, by Pastor Masfa. He, he gave quite a few hints. My purpose, actually, was to look at these commandments, and I was surprised, really, to realize that I had a limited understanding of the Sabbath. And, and, and I think I was more of the mechanocentric before I studied this. That is why you have these issues when Pastor Panerod came. When Jesus healed, the mechanocentric was uncomfortable in the church, in the synagogue. Because they felt that what this guy is doing doesn't fit with the rules and the regulations. Some uh, have a philosophical uh, Sabbath-keeping mentality. They remember, oh, it's the Sabbath day. To keep. Now, I even think we should study on the verb to keep. How do you, I keep? It's already holy. How do I keep? And there is a statement I made in the paper that I believe that it is holy people who keep the Sabbath. Now, what I mean by holy people is people who have been sanctified by Christ. God is the one who makes us holy. Sometimes people confuse uh, holiness with sinlessness. In the God-man relationship, you, they are called saints. You are holy. God calls us holy. It is Israel, the people he called. It is Adam he created. He gave the Sabbath to. That's the, the ideal. That's what I see. So keeping, uh, how does the Sabbath make me holy? It is simply by allowing that God who invades the Sabbath to invade the heart. Not only on that day as we studied, on every day, but most especially on that day. Allowing him to invade not only the space and the time, but the person. Thank you, Pastor. Um, from the text, I will say no, because the commandment, even in Deuteronomy, starts with keep. That's the first word. It is there. And uh, legislation is part of the covenant. But I think we miss the point when we limit ourselves with the legislation. And for me, this will answer even Pastor Kambale's concern about the, the non-Adventist students. How do we present the sabbath to them in our dormitories is it a day that god invades or 
is it just a day of rules and regulations a day of mechanics that's the how how far that thing can go so for me the, the god has a goal he has an overall goal but i think dr greg quad said you cannot reach a destination without knowing how to get there and god gives the how to get there if you remember i mentioned uh, what how and uh, why the ultimate for me is the why when you, when you when the sabbath becomes to you a celebration of god's goodness in creation in redemption in providence in sanctification in glorification even for us we don't conquer canaan we are conquering the, the new jerusalem is that part of our sabbath experience this plan that god has established if we, we don't get from the 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 mechanic the mechanics of the sabbath to reach to that why i think we we will miss a lot and we are missing a lot in the experience of the sabbath and i wanted to say that maybe you will not see the connection with the african experience i am a pastor from africa and i told you a story of a deacon's wife i i found that if i can go and show this to my church members back home i think they will be they will have a different or a better experience of the god of the sabbath we talk more about the day. I think we don't talk much about the God and what he did, actually. What he wants us to remember. Creation, redemption. Thank you. Is there any other question? Thank you, Pastor. I, I was very impressed with the grading. <laughs> the C, B, and A. In, in the Y. I, I was just wondering, the group that Moses is leading, I was wondering what is their literacy level? And what is the value of symbolism and, and, and visib visibility of something to a community of that nature? Because when you read Hebrews, the struggle is for people to move away from seeing Christ in the heavenly to a practical experience. Couldn't this Sabbath and the keeping the doing be one of the areas, maybe the reason some people are concentrating on the how, especially in the African context, is because maybe as pastors we have not focused much on shifting the mind towards the appreciation and so people are still stuck in what is visible only and could couldn't this be one of the aspects that this emphasis seeks to to bring out that though the community is still growing the sabbath was meant to continue harnessing and bringing this as the bible says the law was there to guide the the child until maturity that now the shift is an indication that there has been progress and growth, but still the Sabbath encapsulates, and we should shift towards explaining the reason more, as well as emphasizing as well the, the, the how. So is the literacy level in Africa affecting our experience? And should we pastors deliberately continue to focus also more into shifting that mind? Okay. Um for me, it is not literacy, but per se, but spiritual literacy. You, you know very well that there are some church elders back home who have not gone to any theological school. But when they preach about these things, you the pastor, you sit down, you say, wow, how can this man understand these things so deeply? This is a trend, actually, um, that runs through the Bible, through the history of Israel, through the life of Jesus. I have studied the Gospels many times. I have noticed many things. One that is very interesting is, if you read it very well, you see the struggle Jesus had all the time to shift the people's mind from the earthly to the heavenly. Even in Acts chapter 1. If you read Acts chapter 1, you see that Jesus is there talking about the kingdom of God. And the disciple asks, are you now going to restore the kingdom of 
Israel. You see the mind. Even after spending three years, they are still thinking about Israel. Jesus is telling them, Judea, Samaria, I'm giving you the world. They are thinking Israel. And I think the solution to this is especially for ministers, African ministers who are custodians of these truths. To not only speak about them, but leave them. Bring that God into the sermon. Bring that God into the Sabbath. Bring that God. How many times have you spoken on a, on a Sabbath like Jesus in a synagogue and somebody got healed? We just come, sing, preach, sing, preach, and, and nothing happens. That God invading the place of worship is not there. Even when Jesus went to the temple many times, one time he drove the pastors away and the children came and they started singing. There was praise. That's what he wants to see. But many times I do not. I do not see that. And I think it's a very good question. It's not about literacy per se for me. It's about spiritual literacy. Just opening this word and get going deeper into it personally. Okay, thank you, Pastor. Let's take the last question. No, not the last. Before the last. The last is for me. The last question. For Thank you, Pastor, for your presentation. I just have a little wondering about this, uh, I would say this 10 word of God or standard word of God uh, instead of a 10 commandment. As you see, standard. Let's see that. Take an uh, analogy that we have this research book, green book, and now we have gone so far, maybe third or fourth uh, edition, probably revised. So we've gone first edition, second edition, then now we're using maybe third edition. I'm just a little wondering that if you say that there is a progressive, you know, either. Uh, uh, commandment or words there what did these uh, Israelites use in, in, in their setting and they use both or they mix it or they put away the first one and they use the, the new one something like that just want to know because you added you have this uh, green words in our yes there. yes I think they used both since they are even both in the in the scriptures and that's one of the major points I'm trying to make and that's one thing I really learned from this study these aspects facets of God in the commandments when you go to other passages in Exodus he, he comes as the sanctifier he, he comes in a different package in each but it's still the Sabbath so I think we can even reach a more comprehensive understanding. God is just like giving tits and bits here and there. You see, I am like this. When you look at Genesis 2, there's not much that is said there. God rested, he blessed, and sanctified. That's about what is, as we call it today, the Sabbath, but he called it the seventh day. So I think we keep it, not only both, but all of them. But I would like to see an integrated approach not only in the church but in our homes also how we can leave these and incorporate them together that's how i i see it that's how i see it thank you thank you pastor um l l let me just uh, try to express myself and ask uh, my question I, I do i do believe that uh, we need the what because we have to know what we are talking about and if we destroy the what nothing else can come after i do believe that we need the how because we do need to know how to do the what uh, uh, i believe also that we have to move toward the why and because the sabbath should be meaningful here is my question in exodus we have the rational because god is the creator in Deuteronomy, we have this rational god is the redeemer 
what should be the rationale for our generation or our children right now. Thank you. From, from uh, if I get the question well, you want a contextualized. Uh, I, as I said earlier, for me, it's an integrated. We, we are indebted to our forefathers for what they discovered, what they received. They received about creation, redemption. We have more light, and that's my answer. The rationale is that integrated everything, that creatorship, redemptorship, uh, sanctifying, uh, glorifying, even you, I think uh, you, you need to foresee the new Jerusalem in, within the experience of the Sabbath. I don't know about you, but many times in church when we sing, we have this hope that burns within our hearts. I'm there standing, and if you look at me, sometimes I'm just uh, bubbling. Because I, I, I foresee in the Sabbath, in the church, something that is coming ahead of me, for me. But at the same time, I need to be sanctified. I need to know that I was created. I need all all these aspects. So for me, I need an, we need an integrated approach to the Sabbath to see God as he is fully. That's my... Thank you. Thank you very much, Pastor. Thank you all for your participation. Give yourself a hand. <laughs>